Tell me when we're ready. Huh, it's ready? Uh, Abdurrahman, you got your book? No, we'll take one of these. And let's give Islam one, too. Here, can we trim this? Who else needs a book? No, oh, Risala. Risala is how we're, we'll do our Arabic. It'll be Arabi and Fiqh. Okay. First of all, Ibn Abi Zayd al Qayrawani is the name of the Mu'allif Musannif. The word Musannif is another word for uh, author, the person who did the Tasnif. And uh, he's considered Malik al Saghir. This is how good he was and how uh, serious he was about the matter. He was called Malik al Saghir. And uh, his book. Is just like the Risala is just like the Ajrumiya in how widespread it is, except of course limited to those studying uh, Maliki Fiqh. But anywhere in North Africa that you go, any Egypt, Sudan, uh, the Khalij, who knows Maliki, who knows uh, anything about Maliki Fiqh, they're not going to know the Risala, okay? Because it's one of very early on he wrote this book. And he wrote it in such a way that actually someone in the village, in the town, asked him to write a book for youth. So this book is meant for youth, right? That opens up every bab of fiqh. Bab means is a chapter. Every chapter of fiqh is discussed in it in a very simple way. The first thing he does is he discusses the ruling on the matter. And then he discusses the preconditions of a matter. Then discusses the obligations upon a matter. All right. Then the sunan. Then the makruhat, what's frowned upon, or, or the fada'il first, the virtues, less than sunnah, but virtuous. Then the makruhat, and, or uh, then the mubtilat. Mubtilat is what negates the action. Okay, so in fiqh, this is the way fiqh works. The ruling on the action, what uh, the obligatory parts, the highly recommended parts, the virtuous parts, okay, then the frowned upon parts, and then that which negates the action. That's the structure of any mas'ala of fiqh, any bab of fiqh. And he goes into it uh, with sufficient knowledge that you know the structure of every bab, the main parts of every subject okay, within that bab, but he doesn't go into such details, the fine details. So the way I would put it is that when, you, when a person studies this book, what they will know is... Uh, 75% right of the bab and then the 20 the 75% of what we can call high percentage questions like the high percentage things that come that you come upon in life regarding the matter and then the other 25% which is a lot but it's just not um, you don't come across it all the time right you won't come across this all the time um, uh, you, you can study that in the shuruh in the explanations or other books of fiqh. All right, so uh, why don't we start with Evan? Start from Muqaddimatul Musannif, the introduction of the Musannif. Muqaddimatul hmm? Musannif. Uh, so you're so in this sharh, you're basically going to be reading what's above the line, and the sharh is below the line. Yeah. Uh, in in these uh, literature and these types of books, you have the uh, nas or the the uh, metin, which is the original text, then the sharh, the explanation, then the hashia is the explanation of the explanation, and they do have reasons. They have, they have benefits, right? The benefit is that everyone studies this, so the best way to structure, like let's say everyone studies a book, the best way to structure. A more detailed book is to take the same book, add the details, and then the hashia will go into more detail, and maybe even comparison. So that's the value. Okay, go up. So that's fine. Yeah. Uh, no, no. You're studying. You're reading above the line. Yeah. Okay. Salam. Anytime salla is past tense. If you say salla, you should also say salam. Because they're both past tense. If you say salli, right, that's that's like a, a dua a tense, 
or is really command tense, but with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala it will be considered dua uh, or talab. Okay. Whenever you have someone talking to someone else in a command tense that's above them, it's either request or dua if it's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you're going to salli wa sallim. Right? Salli wa sallim. And when you see it without tashkil, if you see sad lam, sad lam is salli. Sad lam, and then the alif uh, the, in the form of the ya is salla. Alright, so salli wa sallim. Good. Where are you at? No, no, don't read below the line, just read above the line. Oh, okay. Yeah. Next page. Above the line is the text, below the line is all the shot. Good. All right, stop here. So first thing he begins with alhamd. Anytime you begin anything that is dhubal, as the Prophet ﷺ said, dhubal, uh, of any import you have to begin with the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so what does it mean with the name of Allah it could be simply saying Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim it could be Alhamdulillah uh, any type of name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala now there are written works out there major written works that don't begin with Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim right but what's important what they say is that uh, perhaps the author said it right so even if it doesn't be it, in pen it should begin with Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim however if it doesn't, and for our purposes, a lot of our things, we shouldn't put Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim on something that's going to, be, or any of the name of Allah or Qur'an, on things that will be mass produced or mass disseminated, because it can go on the ground, could go on the garbage, and what's intended by it is sufficiently that you say it, uh, even if you don't write it. It doesn't have, you don't have to write it, you can just say it. Right? Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Likewise, if people say, send you salam in an email, Obviously, the sort of um, thing is you respond back, right? But let's say you don't, at least you say it. What's important is that you say it. But you should respond back because in letter writing, they do respond back with the full salam. All right, so he begins, Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. Alhamdulillah, Alladhi ibtada al-insana bi ni'matihi. I'm just going to go over the, the words without much explanation for now. Alhamdulillah, Alladhi ibtada'a, initiated or began, al-insana, the human being. بِنِعْمَتِهِ With his blessing. What's the opposite of his, or the corollary of his blessing, his ni'mah? This is adl, justice. So the corollary of blessing is justice. So if it's about by justice, then we don't deserve to be created. Right? There's nothing that we did that deserves a repayment of our being created. So he began, he began us with his ni'mah. Right? So the default of our existence is we are owed nothing. Right? We are owed nothing. Okay, this is the default situation. Wasawarahu, a taswir is uh, designed. He designed us, all right? Uh, he, so, ibtada al insan, he brought the, the, just the idea. You, you having trouble finding your, your passage? Let me see. Uh, okay, so all this is. Okay. Uh, oh, okay. This is going to be a problem because the whole thing is the shar. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so just look on with Islam until we get you a copy. You can photocopy this book today, inshallah. All right? You're going to be giving staples a lot of business. Okay. You take this and photocopy as much as you can of it, however much money you have in your pocket. And that's your tuition. Okay. 
All right. Alhamdulillah, the ibtada al insana, he thought up or, or uh, initiated the human being, wasawarahu, like literally uh, fashioned him, fil arhami, in the womb, okay, uh, bi hikmati, and of course it's angels that we believe fashion the human being in the womb based upon what the, the destiny of the human being is. Bi hikmatihi. With his wisdom. So why does he say here, Bihikmati? Because some people have, and there are haves and have-nots in the creation. Some people have great forms, some people have lesser forms. So what explains for us that there are some people who have lesser forms? Right? There are some people who are born with defects and, and, and less beauty and strength than others. And intelligence, that's Allah's hikmah. So he says here, any deficiency that exists in a creation is by his hikmah. Right? So you, if someone uh, born or created without uh, what other people have, this is attributed to Allah's hikmah. So, وَرَهُ فِي الْأَرْحَامِ بِحِكْمَتِهِ وَأَبْرَزَهُ إِلَى رِفْقِهِ And he brought him out of the womb, okay, and to his rifq. And rifq means gentleness. Like, uh, rifq is something, your rafiq, like in Lion King, is a friend. It's in Swahili, rafiq is a friend. Rafiqi literally means my friend. Right, my close friend, Rafiq. Ila rifqihi. And what is his rifq in the earth? What is the rifq that Allah gives every baby in the earth? Any guess? The mom. Good. Ila rifqihi. And then all the other things. The mom, the dad, the house, the food. وَمَا يَسَّرَهُ لَهُ مِنْ رِزْقِهِ And what Allah made easy of rizq because children and babies receive rizq with no effort. Later on, they have to win their... They have to, they're going to get the same rizq, but they have to work for it. وَمَا يَسَّرَهُ What Allah made easy for him مِنْ رِزْقِهِ Of his rizq وَعَلَّمَهُ مَا لَمْ يَكُنْ يَعْلَمْ And he taught him right, what he, he didn't know عَلَّمَهُ مَا لَمْ يَكُنْ يَعْلَمْ He taught the human being what he didn't know um, Okay, keep reading Islam Actually, let's go in this order You don't, you don't have a book? We're sharing a book, okay. All right, read from Wakana Fadlullahi Alayhi Adima. All right, so Wakana Fadlullahi Alayhi Adima. What is Fadl? Fadl is what you don't deserve or need. This is Fadl, right? So ask from Allah, min Fadli, ask Allah from His Fadl. Fadl is leftovers, right? Fadl is leftovers. Like fadalat with a fatha is what you pass out of your body after eating. Okay? So the fadl is something you don't need. You didn't earn it. You don't need it. But Allah gave it to you anyway. And this is the status of the human being, right? We all of us were happy in life because of fadl. If Allah only gave us what we need to survive, right? We would have very little. And Allah has those people on the earth. The nomads, right? The super poor, even the super poor, in some some countries, have it better off than the Bedouin that used to exist. The whole world it was filled with nomads, Bedouins, people who just have what they need, so that a human being can realize how much nama we have by looking at those people, and because they have to fulfill that horrible role of having the bare minimum of what human beings can survive on, then on Yom Qiyamah their hisab will be much easier. Right? Because they had to be those sort of sacrifices in this life so that all of us can say, wow, look at what we have. The Prophet ﷺ said, anyone who is belittling his ni'mah, what you have, go look at what other people don't have. And for the Arabs, that was very easy. If you're a city dweller in Arabia, all you have to do is wait until a nomad passes and you see no doesn't have anything. right? No uh, clothes, just one garment or two. No concept of civilization even. No concept of like ambition, uh, upward mobility. That stuff doesn't exist. There's only one job that they have every day, survive. That's it. Every day and it renews itself. He doesn't even advance to the point that you think, okay, let me use these resources so that I could survive one day and rest the next day. Then I have to restart. No, every day he's restarting the process of survival. So that's basically the idea of fadl. And you should always know that uh, Allah loves to give fadl to His servants. Some people think, oh, Allah should only give us what we need to survive and anything else is excessive. That's not correct at all. 
the reason people love Allah, as the Prophet ﷺ said, is Allah keeps giving them what they don't need, what is extra. Also, fadl, fadl, when it increases, it renders the human being into an oppressor, right? It makes him miserable. And that's why every once in a while, we have to be brought down, right, to the negative, where we are suffering. And suffering clears out all the bad habits uh, and false beliefs about ourselves and the world and others uh, that uh, develop when we have excess. Then, وَكَانَ فَضْلُ اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ عَظِيمًا وَنَبَّهَهُ بِأَثَارِ صَنْعَتِهِ نَبَّهَهُ التَّنْبِيهِ is to point something out to someone. This is called tanbi, to point something out to someone. Nabahahu. So what did he point him out to? To the existence of Allah. Nabahahu with what? The first thing that Allah Azza wa Jal uses to point out to a human being of his existence is athari sanatihi, the effects of his creation. The creation of Allah Azza wa Jal is the first thing that the human being can look at, see all around him that indicates that there's a maker. All right? And we said many times in Aqidah classes that by looking at the creation, you come upon, all right? or well, let's, say, let's go back because we don't know it's creation yet. Creation involves a creator. So let's just say by looking at uh, what we would call nature, okay? by looking at the natural world, it indicates to you a number of things that there's order there's death there's life there's rebirth okay there's intelligence okay there are systems systems indicate intelligence you cannot find a system somewhere except intelligence is behind it all these indicators and also that it's systematic you don't see clashes okay so it indicates to you certain attributes of the creator but it's not going to indicate and that there is a creator but it won't indicate to you the Creator's name, His attributes, what He wants from us, or anything about our origins, or anything about our future. Right? Only revelation can do that. But what the looking at the natural world should repel shirk. It should repel and make it very clear that idols and other humans are not God. And that's why all right, there are a people, a sabi'in, that they never received a message. But just by their intellects, they denied paganism and idolatry and the worship of humans, animals, or other things. Okay? And that's what's required. Just This is an aqidah point. Just by virtue of having a brain, Allah does not accept you. By having a brain, He doesn't expect you just by intellect to come to the point that there is Allah, afterlife, salah, psalm, no. You're not going to know those things. But he does expect you to know that there is one creator, right? You don't even expect it to know his name. Just that there's one creator and that paganism is false. Just by having an intellect, we are expected to know these things, right? And we'll be taken to account according to the Maturidiya, right? It will be taken to account and punished if Allah gave you a brain and you still worshipped an idol. Hmm? I know that there's one creator and one, two, three. Well, probably by analogy, right? By analogy. Because there is no a system except that it has to have one chief, right? You can't have, are there two head coaches to any team? Are there two general managers? Are there one act, uh, active owner? More than one active owner? They're in man if, when you look at management, any human system that's been managed by humans, right? You will never find Right? Dual management, or two, two managers. A ship, only have one. A kitchen, can only have one chef. Right? All of human endeavors are like this. Right? So when you see that this earth keeps moving, this winter, now it's spring again. And it's winter, and now it's spring again. And that everything fits like a puzzle piece. You realize this whole thing is managed. It can only be one manager. It can't be another manager. Okay? But they must reject the pagan gods. This is... Uh, now once revelation comes once a prophet comes now your responsibility goes up a second notch now to accept what that prophet has brought okay and then every new prophet that comes you're obligated to follow that so that's the difference between those who have intellect alone 
and those who have intellect and have received a prophet. Okay, they call that al aql and al naql. You have intellect and you also have uh, revelation. All right, uh, Hamza, you you got the book? Yeah. All right. bi sanati, and then wa adara ilayhi. All right, so stop here. So now we just said the natural world, we use our intellect, it should repel shirk and give us the first part of the shahada, which is la ilaha. That not all, all these false gods are wrong, are, are false, are meaningless. Okay? But how will you know the attributes of the Maker, His name, all He wants from us? You will never know that except through transmission of a Prophet. The Prophet has to receive this information from Allah and give it to us. Uh, the great Imam al-Sha'rawi gives a metaphor. Okay? He says, if you are outside, or, or if you are inside, and you get a knock on the door, a systematic knock on the door, okay? Your intellect must tell you that it's not an acorn, right? It's not the wind, because it's systematic, knock on the door. It's not going to be a dog, a raccoon, right? There's got to be a human being, right? It's got to be something of intelligence. Something with intelligence, there's only one being that we deal with, the intelligence, human beings. Even those are like extinct, <laughs> the way most people are acting these days. But it's got to be a human being. But can you tell who it is? From the knock, no. All you could tell is it's a human being. Unless someone goes out of the door that you trust, someone that you trust, that is sane, etc., goes out of the door, talks to the person, then comes back. That's the example of prophecy. So just by hearing the knock, you know that there's, it's not anything from the natural world. It's not going to be a dog or a cat or a raccoon or the wind. It's going to be a human being, an intelligent human being that is systematic, right? And they're knocking and etc. However, only if a trustworthy source goes out, talks to that knocker and comes back in, right? Can you have any information about the person knocking? And that's what he says next. Which means now he gave him no excuse. All right? So up to the fact that you're just looking at the natural world, you have a lot of excuses. And the requirement of you is very little. But now that you have, وَأَعْذَرَ إِلَيْهِ He gave him no excuse. From whom? عَلَىٰ أَلْسِنَةِ الْمُرْسَلِينَ الْخِيَرَةِ مِنْ خَلْقِهِ the, uh, from, the, uh, from the tongues of the chosen messengers from his creation. Okay? And in our example, the guy, the person who goes out, outside the door and talks to the one who's knocking and finds out all the information and comes back and tells you, now you have no excuse. Of course, there are a number of conditions because let's say we're all sitting in the house and someone's knocking and then a stranger in the room goes out and comes back we're not ob obligated to believe him we don't know who you are you could be lying right you could be mistaken you could be you don't know how to transmit information so there are a lot of conditions on that person who goes out and comes back in order for us to have to believe him to be required to believe him he should be one of us. We should know him inside out. He should be speaking our language. He should have no background of lying. No uh, uh, past history of having other ambitions or personal goals. Right? So that is, these are all in Aqidah come as the requirements of prophets. And in a way, also the requirements of dua, da'wah. Okay? So when for da'wah to truly be transmitted to a people, in, that, in a way that Allah Azza wa considers that they have received the message, they have no excuse, that da'i should have those uh, attributes as well. He should be a known entity to the people. He should be one of them. He should have a good background. And obviously, uh, in, when it comes to da'wah, it's not going to be one. It'll be a whole generation of people. All right, now what do these prophets do? Wissam, pick it up. Fahada. <laughs> Okay, now guidance and misguidance. Again, we come to these corollary things. Guidance is not something you deserve, right? It is not something a human being deserves. 
It is something that Allah grants as a gift. Okay? Fahada, He guided men. Wafaqahu bifadlihi. He guided the one whom he gave him tawfiq with his fadl. Okay? Wa'adalla man khadalahu bi'adlihi. And he led astray whom he uh, humiliated, khadalahu, abandoned or disgraced bi'adlihi by his justice. Now here comes a big aqidah question. How are we responsible for our actions if Allah is telling us that He's only the one who guides and misguides? Okay. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes us responsible as soon as He, number one, gives us a brain. And we just said that there's a very limited responsibility once Allah gives you a sound brain. That's why those who don't have sound intellects, they have no responsibility. If you have a brain, you have some responsibility to negate all uh, false gods and to know that there's one maker. Once you have a prophet now, to the degree that that prophet has educated you, you're now responsible to follow him. So what, if we are responsible and we can go to heaven and hell, then how do we answer the question of how Allah says many times in the Quran and in the Hadith that He's the one who guides and He's the one who misguides. The reason being is that we receive the, revela- these, the, the, the news and the revelation and the teachings based on our responses that Allah will increase us in guidance or misguidance. The guidance is solely from Allah Azza wa Jal. Okay? It's solely from Allah Azza wa Jal. But the misguidance is by us if we reject the message and continue to reject the message. And Allah keeps giving us different avenues, the message from different avenues, different people, different ways, different times in our lives, yet we continue to insist on rejecting it, then, what does he say here? Bi'adlihi, by his justice. So now, by my actions, I have requested to be misguided, right? Because I keep pushing back the message, so then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, okay, you keep pushing it back, I'll help you be misguided. And this is the example of Surah Al-Baqarah, which says, Khatam Allahu ala qulubihim. Allah has sealed their hearts shut. So we should ask a question. How is he going to go to hell? Why should he go to hell if Allah sealed his heart shut? The Sahaba, gave an ex- Ibn Abbas, explained it. He said, Allah doesn't seal his heart shut from the first time, nor from the second, nor tenth, or twelfth. After years of Allah giving this person chance after chance after chance, now this person, by his own action, if the heart is like a hand, one rejection, ten more rejections, 50 rejections, he continues to reject until he locks his own heart, right? He locks his own heart just as he's blocked the light from reaching the palm of his hand with his own actions, then Allah begins to help him. Allah begins to make the, uh, the prophetic message ugly in his eyes and make paganism and kufr beautiful in his eyes. We call this istidraj. But Allah doesn't do this from the start. He does this after the person has insisted upon kufr. This is why Anytime we get a message and an invitation to the good, we have to accept it. Even if we don't, or if the person is wrong in what they're saying, or rude, or it's not obligatory, we shouldn't utter words of rejection. Because if you continue getting used to repelling those types of invitations to the good, then Allah will one day make you hate them, right? And make it easy. So for example, uh, Imam Malik, a, a boy came to him, and for some reason, the boy said something strange. And he told Imam Malik after Asr, they had just prayed Asr, he said, go pray two rakas, right? In the middle of his class. For some reason, some boy just said it. Imam Malik got up and prayed two rakas. Okay? Then the students looked at him because they know you're not supposed to pray after Asr. Number one. Number two, a majlis of ilm is superior to nafila. But Imam Malik said, Allah says in the Quran, وَإِذَا قِيلَ لَهُمْ رُكَعُوا لَا يَرْكَعُونَ Surah Al-Mursalat Right? Towards the end of the surah, Allah says about the kuffar, وَإِذَا قِيلَ لَهُمْ رُكَعُوا لَا يَرْكَعُونَ Okay? Uh, if they're told to pray, they don't pray. They refuse to pray. So he said, I don't want to be like them in any way, shape, or form. And that's more important to avoid being like them than the other two matters which the, that it's frowned upon to pray after us. Nafila and that knowledge is superior. So he refused to say no to the boy who told him to go pray two rakas and he went and did it. All right. So if someone comes and tells us to do something of the good, we should say, Bi'ithnillah, 
that you will, may Allah give me the tawfiq. Don't say, I can't or I'm weak. Say, no, may Allah make me stronger. This is something Abu Hassan al Shadli said. If someone tells you to do something good, don't say, I'm weak. Say, may Allah make me stronger. Because it's the same meaning, but one has a good future. The other, it's as if you've locked yourself into a state of weakness. Okay. فَهَدَ مَنْ وَفَقْ So the guidance is by Allah's fadl. And the misguidance is by our own doing. Then Allah assists us. Alright, keep reading. وَيَسَّرَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ All right, which means here, وَيَسَّرَ Made easy. Who? المؤمنين. Okay. He made the uh, the easy path, right? The good path, easy for the believers. Right? Al-Yusra is the easy path, which is also another name for the path of guidance. Surah Al-Layl speaks about Al-Yusra, right? An easy path. Why? Because the sacred law makes this life and the next life easy. It makes this life and the next life easy by blocking off the major problems that cause, the major things that cause problems. And you could really number them into three. Three or four matters that destroy, really three matters that destroy and make life impossible. Number one, family related problems. Uh, procreating and interacting with genders in the wrong way. So zina has been made prohibited for us. All right, to, uh, uh, ikhtilat has been made prohibited for us. Like mingling men and women without reason and cause and all these things, it, it staves off zina, it protects marriages. Okay, So the matters of gender, how genders are handled, okay, protects the family, it establishes marriage in the right way, children are born in the right way. All of these problems... How many problems develop just from this one issue? That this civilization has no guidance on how to handle the opposite genders, right? If you have two opposite, like uh, when you charge a car, you got two opposite thing, uh, 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 forces, there are rules, right? You can't just be playing around with a plus and minus, right? You have to treat them properly. You can't be putting them in the wrong spot. Likewise, the uh, attractive charge between men and women has to have some guidance. That's the first thing. The second thing is intoxicants, right? Second major reason that there are problems in societies has to do with intoxicate, intoxicants. So you close that door off. And number three, uh, riba, interest, is a destructive force in society. Right? It elevates certain people who aren't bringing any benefit to society and it destroys other people who are in need of help. Okay, so interest. So these three things, if you just contemplate with your intellect, these are the three sources of most problems in society. Family, gender and family issues, intoxicants, and then you go into interest, so financial, uh, that financial aspect. Interest and in all the trades that are uh, unregulated, uh, with guidance we have them regulated. So it's called al-yusra. Keep reading. <laughs> okay, first you said, وَشَرَحَ sudurahum لِذِّكْرَى why is it that people, a man came to the Prophet ﷺ say, why is it that we see some people, they have fear of God and others don't? Like why is it that people find it easy to be in Islam and others find it so difficult? Right? The answer is very simple. It's sharh al-sadr. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made their heart love Islam and every aspect of it. And then the Quran mentions it. Uh, this is a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for those who give effort. Right? It's kasbi. Kasbi means something that is a gift that you can earn, as opposed to wahbi. Wahbi is something you can't earn. For example, uh, most you got talents and skills, right? A skill you can learn. You can learn how to build a house. You can learn how to program. But a talent, right, is something that's innate. It's God given. Okay, you can't you can't uh, train someone to it. So there's wahb is from Allah directly. You can use it for good or bad, right? It'll be a benefit for you or it'll be a curse. And there's kasb, something you earn. The sharh, a sadr, is kasbi. By giving effort for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, having piety, then Allah will open your heart and you will find yourself loving the deen and every aspect of the deen. I mean, look at us here. All right, it's a beautiful sunny day out. You know, people could be doing a whole bunch of things, but you, you love these books. Right? You just have a love for the deen. What is, what is that? That's just a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if we don't take care of it, we lose it. Right? How many people you've seen, they love the deen? Right? 
but they lost it. They didn't respect this gift that Allah gave them, right? They didn't respect it. And now it's gone. And they're out on the beach uh, doing the zina with their eyes and what else, whatever else they're doing. Okay, so, وَشَرَحَ سُدُورَهُمْ لِذِّكْرَ So they love every mention of the deen. All right? And the dhikra is the Qur'an and the, the revelation in general. فَآمَنُوا بِاللَّهِ Now, iman billah is of three, three aspects. Abdul Rahman, iqra. فَآمَنُوا بِاللَّهِ فَآمَنُوا بِاللَّهِ بِأَلْسِنَتِهِمْ نَاطِقِينَ نَاطِقِينَ وَبِقُلُوبِهِمْ وَبِقُلُوبِهِمْ مُقْتِسِينَ وَبِمَا آتَيْتُمْ بِهِ بِسُلُوكُ وَقُتُوبُهُ عَلَىٰ عَامِلِينَ عَامِلِينَ yeah. All right, stop right here. All right, فَآمَنُوا بِاللَّهِ إِمَانْ بِاللَّهِ سُبْحَانَهُ وَتَعَالَىٰ True Iman has man- three manifestations. Three manifestations. Iman. If you believe in anything, right, a cause, any cause, if you really believe in it, it has three manifestations. Okay. فَآمَنُوا بِاللَّهِ Number one, بِأَلْسِنَتِهِمْ نَاطِقِينَ Your tongue will say it. And for us, the shahada, la ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah. Okay? Your tongue will speak it. Number two, wa bi qulubihim mukhlisin. Okay? With their hearts, it's in their heart, the source of sincerity, ikhlas. Right? Ikhlas, mukhlisin, sincere. Wa bima atatum bihi rusulu wa kutubu amilin. And with their, in their, with their bodies, they act upon it. What is the action? What the book and the messengers have brought. Bima atathum, right? What uh, the rusuluhu, the messengers, what kutubuhu, the holy books, have brought. So this is why deen and iman is connected to knowledge. Because if you want to express your iman, how are you going to express it? You're going to keep saying, I'm a mu'min, I'm a mu'min? No. You need to act upon it. And if you don't have knowledge, then you don't know what to do, right? So the more knowledge you have, the more stuff you can do, right? So the more your iman grows. So the more knowledge, the more action, the more action, the more iman. It continues like this. And this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, uh, That's why only people who know have any real fear of Allah, right? Why? Because they know stuff, they can do stuff. They can take action. And when they take action, their iman increases, right? But if you have no knowledge, then what, how can you have fear of Allah? Like, what are you going to do? So the more knowledge a person has, the more they could advance their iman. In, like, in business, the more money you have, the more money you can make, right? If you, have, if you don't have money to start, then you can't grow, have a business to begin with, right? So it's the same way. And this is why our deen is a deen of knowledge. If you want to advance and you want to act and prove your iman to Allah Azza wa Jal, and dis- put on display your love for Allah Azza wa Jal, okay? Put on display for Allah to see you need to do stuff. How are you going to do anything if you don't know anything? So you need to know. All right, so this is why our deen begins with knowledge, okay, uh, before action. All right, bima atatum bi rusul wa kutubuhu amilin. All right, Islam, top it off. Wata'allamu, go for wata'allamu. Good. Good. Uh, Good. 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 They learned, right? Ma'allamahum, right? Okay, they studied what the prophets have taught, all right? They studied, you learned. And when they learned, what did they do? So basically, it's action. The first action, the most valuable action in the sight of Allah is to stop at what is haram, is more valuable than to do what is halal, right? Why? Because the sinners, the hypocrites, and the pious, they all do good deeds. The difference is who can stop himself from doing bad deeds. This is bigger of a deal than to do good. To not do the evil is superior, more superior than anything else, than doing the good. 
All right, because as Ibn Qayyim said, all of us, uh, um, all of us, do the good. It's easy to do the good. It's uh, <laughs> it's uh, there's social reward for doing the good. There's a social reward in a Muslim community to show up doing the good. Okay, because the people, your family, and people around you are gonna like you. They're gonna say, "Oh, he's good." Right, but the sins is something you can always keep doing in private. The bad thoughts is something no one will know. So the real piety is in stopping. And if we can't stop, okay, there are two rules. If you cannot stop doing a wrong, number one, don't blame destiny and say it's the qadr of Allah that I keep doing this sin. This is number one thing about this matter is do not put. The issue on destiny. This is kufr billah. You say, oh, I, 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 I can't stop. This must be the qadr of Allah. You actually can say that for other people. All right? You can say that for other people. You can say, oh, qadr Allah, he has, uh, you know, that's his thing. But for yourself, you can't. Okay? Number two, the door of tawbah. If you cannot be from someone who doesn't sin, right, then know that everyone commits sins at some level. Be a person of tawbah. If you cannot be purified from sin, don't don't quit. Rather, be a, someone who makes tawbah. And Allah loves two types of people. The one who's purified his behavior from committing sins, and he still does wrongs, but very much less than the major wrongs. Right? Just some minor wrongs here and there. And without consistency. Alright? And someone who does wrong, but he makes tawbah. Allah loves them both. And Allah يحب التوبين ويحب المتطاهرين. So, وَوَقَّفُوا عِنْدَمَا حَدَّ لَهُمْ And how can you stop at the prohibitions if you don't even know them? Right? So you got to learn them. وَاسْتَغْنَوْا بِمَا أَحَلَّ لَهُمْ عَمَّا حَرَّمْ عَلَيْهِمْ What does استغنوا mean? استغنوا means to find sufficiency. الغني, in the Arabic language, the word غنى does not, rich, does not mean rich. It doesn't mean you have a lot of stuff. It means you have no needs. True wealth is you have no needs. Right? So what does that do? That makes all of us have the capacity to be wealthy. Right? If true wealth is having no needs, therefore true wealth is inside your heart. There is, that's why there was a king one time, uh, a, a, a prince. This, is some, this happened apparently many times and there are a lot of legends similar to the Buddha, uh, Siddhartha Gautama. Uh, he saw he was a prince and he was sitting... Uh, in his palace and he looked out the window and he saw a poor man singing right and the song was khubzun wa malhun wa zaytun so he had some oil some salt some bread and a, and a bowl of water and sat under a tree haggard man right and he was singing a song and saying I have bread I have salt I have oil I have water right uh, what else does a person need whoever isn't thankful for this meal Right is ungrateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so he ate from it and then he ate his full and then he fell asleep under the tree and the prince said this man is happier than me right? and he realized that happiness is not by having happiness is by not desiring so if you're a rich man but you desire more you're miserable okay? and if you have very little and you desire nothing then you're happy so that's what true happiness is so وَاسْتَغْنَوْ have uh, be sufficient with what? Bima ahallalahum means what Allah made halal for them. Amma haram alayhim to the exception of Amma Anma Haram alayhim what Allah prohibited. So he's sufficient with what Allah made halal so that he doesn't have to take what Allah made haram. Okay, and this for us the halal may be for some people. No, not that much. Okay? Not that much. But um, and the haram is is out there for us to take, so this is part of our discipline to make ourselves happy with the halal. Then what is haram? There was a man one time. He was too overweight, okay, and he used to love to eat. He used to love to eat, and this guy was like a baller, like one of those types that was going around in young days, clubs, women, all this, all this stuff. And then he changed his life, right? And he got married, settled down, and he uh, used to eat, right? Eating was his thing. Finally, one day, his wife said to him, why do you just love to eat so much? Okay? 
don't you love anything else? Have any other hobby except food? He says, I love a lot of things, but this is what's halal. <laughs> okay? So for him, that's a ibadah, right? That's, his, that's good for him. Because in his past, he was doing a lot of other things, but he limited himself to what's halal, right? Even though it's bad to overeat, but for him it's okay. That's why I say a tyrant, for him to sleep all day is worship. Because when he wakes up, he oppresses people, right? So for him to sleep is good. So for people who grew up in sins, Right, al istigna. So this really we haven't touched on the fiqh. It's just the introduction. But if we're going to do the metan properly, we have to go through every letter of it. So uh, that'll be it for lesson one. Uh, we'll move quicker, inshallah, for the aqidah element, so that we can get straight to the fiqh. But inshallah, there's khir and everything. Uh, any comments or questions? Abdurrahman, you good? This this is my old phone, which I only use for the uh, these podcasts or these streams, whatever they're called. Hmm? Oh, you put it in both. Okay, good. Okay. Uh, with Sam, if anyone could put the link for the Risal of Ibn Abi Zaid, the translation of Aisha Buli, or other people, other uh, uh, Arabic and English, any links that you have, just stick them in there. All right. All right, good. So if that's it, we'll wrap up here. Let's see if anyone on the stream has any questions. What is that? Khaled, where is he? At work. Huh? Yeah, work. What, he got a job? MashaAllah. Yeah. Okay. سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك نشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت نستغفرك ونتوب إليك والعصر إن الإنسان لا في خسر إلا الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر